Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. Hi, how's it going? Want to talk? Technology? So you want to talk about content management systems. I'm, who am I? Why, hello there. Welcome to my cabin in the woods. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that's, well, that's the weirdest one so far. Well, this has been a disaster so far. How about we just dive right into the content, shall we? So we're at the Next.js conference, which means that you've either standardized on Next and are using it all over the place, or you're familiar with it, or you've tinkered with it, or you're, at the very least, interested in it enough to be here. Well, what I want to talk to you about today is the content side of things, the back-end piece, how we can find different data sources and plug them in to your Next.js application. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Sean C. Davis. The C is very important. It's not the letter of the day, it's just my middle initial, but it makes my name so totally unique. I work for Ample, which is a small boutique digital agency in Cincinnati, Ohio. My job title is Director of Technology, which is a fancy way of saying I do a lot of different things with technology. But really, I'd say I spend the majority of my days uh, helping my team work efficiently and productively with Jamstack websites that we build with Next, among many, many other uh, tools and technologies. You can find me on Twitter at SeanCDavis29, which I guess means that C doesn't make my name entirely unique. The 29 stands for, uh, or, or comes from my birthday, which is February 29th, which, yes, is Leap Day. And that means that technically I've had eight birthdays so far. This is a picture of Stella. You've already seen her in the several failed attempts to get this thing started. Stella is extremely talented. She has one talent, and it is she can hold various objects and balance them atop her head or her nose, and she does a great job with that and gets paid handsomely in food. Now, two things about me before we move on. One, I love sandwiches. I've never really met a sandwich I didn't like. I mean, that's probably not true, but usually the best sandwich I've had is the last sandwich. Um, I, I would be happy to have uh, any number of sandwich type discussions with you. I also love stories. I love hearing them. I love sharing them. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna have too much time to share stories today, like why I'm in this cabin, or that one time I got attacked by a squirrel or the best sandwich I've ever eaten. But if you catch me after this or sometime in the future, ask me. I'd love to share a story with you and I'd love to hear your story. Okay, so today I wanna to answer two questions. Question number one is how might we choose the right CMS? There are so many choices out there. How do we wade through all those choices? How do we pick what is best for our projects? And then number two, how might we minimize rework after we've chosen the wrong one? And I'm being goofy here. I don't necessarily mean choosing the wrong one, but you will inevitably at some point have to use more than one data source. So when that happens, how do we minimize the amount of code that you have to write to be able to support a new data source? Before we jump in and start answering those questions, let's talk about the different types of content management systems. Really, as it concerns next projects, there are two types of content management systems. This is ignoring a third type, which we'll just call the monolithic application, the old uh, WordPress model or the Squarespace where the, the front end and the back end are all coupled together in that same application. We're gonna ignore that for now. And we're just gonna say, as it relates to next type projects, there are two types of content management systems. They are either API driven or Git based. And the difference between the two has everything to do with how data is stored and how that data is consumed. For API driven content management systems, the data is stored in a database and the content is consumed via 
you guessed it, an API. There are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of tools out there, services that fall under this category of API driven content management systems. Some that you may have heard of are Contentful, Agility, Dato, Prismic, Sanity, and yes, even WordPress. WordPress has a plugin that can make it a headless CMS where it shuts off the front end of the website and allows you to access the data in the database via an API. Git-based content management systems, in contrast, store the data in flat files usually within some repository. Those files are typically either markdown files, YAML files, JSON files. And so then the content of your site is consumed simply by reading those files. There are a couple tools out there that have been emerging in the last few years to follow this Git-based approach. And those are Forestry and Netlify CMS. Both of those tools sit on top of repositories and provide this nice uh, editing experience for your project. Then there's also Pros, and Pros is this tool that sits on top of GitHub and kind of provides a little bit of a cleaner interface, a little bit more of an editorial type of interface um, for editing content. But the interesting thing here is technically Git providers like Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub, those could all technically be content management systems. They provide you a UI to be able to manipulate content in your repository. So if the front end of your website is simply reading files that already exist in your repository, well then you could use one of those tools and have folks edit content right within your repository. So with so many options out there today, how do you pick what's best for you and for your projects? Well, one approach, an approach I've taken in the past, is to simply choose the best tool for the job, to evaluate everything that's available to you, to look at the front end requirements for your project, and then pick the best one each time. But there's a problem with that. The problem is that it's simply not a productive way to work. You don't want to throw out all your solutions every time just because it seems like there's something newer, shinier, and better to go after. Instead, what I like to do is find a preferred set of tools that solve most of my problems. So I, generally speaking, I know what the front end projects of my team that my team's gonna build generally are going to look like. Now, they, they vary quite a bit, but they vary within this range that I feel like we have some control over. And therefore, it's not just one CMS that works for us, but a couple. And so we've picked two or three of our favorites and built tooling around uh, those particular examples and, and those particular choices. And so for us, those don't solve every problem. There's not one go-to CMS for every project that comes in the door, but we, we still look at the, the criteria for that project and then evaluate based on our preferred set of tools, which one we're going to use. But instead of choosing from a hundred and starting from scratch every time, we're choosing from two or three and starting from a place that we know and that we've worked from before. And so how do you evaluate all of these tools against one another? Well, here's some criteria which I tend to use to look across the board. The left side here are items that we would typically uh, use to compare any tool any, really any third-party service that we're going to invest in, CMS or non-CMS, whereas the column on the right are CMS-specific attributes. So we're looking at things like cost, pricing model, maybe uh, for one particular project, single, the ability to have single sign-on is really important. Um, to, the, having real-time previews might be really important, or the ability to schedule, uh, to schedule publish events. It all just depends on what the, what, what's your next project, but also what are all of the projects that you typically work on and how can you develop that preferred set of tools knowing the criteria that is important to you. Once you have compared a handful of these popular CMSs based on criteria that is important to you, just pick a few and try them, try them out. Because in the end, there are a few intangibles that you can't get from some spreadsheet. 
you don't know what the editing experience is like. How do you how do you quantify that? You know, what's the editing experience? What's the developer experience? What's it like to work with one of these tools? What's it like to edit content within one of these tools? How does the content how does how does the content flex to support the way that you like to build front-end applications? There are a lot of intangibles there that you can't get from just putting criteria down on a spreadsheet. And so I say, you might just have to get in there and get your feet wet a little bit. But that can be really overwhelming because it seems like every week there's a new tool on the scene. So the later you come into this game, the more CMSs there are to wade through to try to make these decisions. So another approach is to meet your editors where they already are. Consider some client has their content already in WordPress. So instead of migrating them to some cool new shiny CMS that you prefer, maybe you should go ahead and figure out how to make WordPress work with the front ends that you've built. That way the editors don't have to flex, they can stay really comfortable and you get to put a new tool in your tool belt and, and a new skill that you've built there. Now that's one idea. Another idea is not just meeting the editors where they are, but what if you could meet the content where it is? And that's kind of saying the same thing in that if content's already in WordPress, maybe you should use WordPress. But I'm also thinking, well, what if content that you want to show up on the front of the, of the website doesn't actually exist in a content management system, but is in another place that you have access to? In other words, what if the best CMS for your Next.js project wasn't really meant to be a CMS? These could be project management or task management systems like Trello or Jira or Asana or shoot, even GitHub issues. They could be hosted databases like FaunaDB or Mongo Atlas or any one of the several services provided by AWS, Azure or Google Cloud. It could be spreadsheets. You could use spreadsheets. You could use Google Sheets as your CMS. How crazy is that? That's crazy. It's crazy. Don't, I, don't do it. Don't do it. You could though. You could. You totally could. You could use cloud file storage providers like Dropbox or Google Drive or B2, or again, any one of these services provided by those three major players, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And you could even use local apps or editors. We've already talked a little bit about this, but with the Git-based file storage, uh, anything can be a CMS. It's, you can have markdown files, YAML files, JSON files. You could use the Bear Editor, which saves your content locally on your machine. You could technically use VS Code as a content management sol solution, or Typora, which is just a, a way to edit markdown files on your machine. In other words, anything with an API, or anything with an ability to write files, can be a content management system. And you can have more than one content management system for your Next.js project. So let's play out a somewhat realistic scenario. You know what? I think it's sandwich time. I think it's sandwich time. It's sandwich time. Now, the examples that I'm going to go through here are super high level, and I'm going to move really quickly because I want to talk more about the idea than the code itself. However, all the code that you're going to find here is available at Sean C. Davis slash everything is a CMS on GitHub. And yes, I was the first Sean C. Davis on GitHub, and I feel like that's a huge victory for me. Let's say we wanted to build a website that was displaying sandwich information. We want to show a title and an image and some descriptive text for a handful of different types of sandwiches. And let's say that we want that data to come from Contentful. We've chosen Contentful as our content management system for this particular project. Well, what does that look like? Well, a really typical pattern in a next project is to drop pages in the pages directory because they just work and they get mapped to that path at which you've dropped that file. So if I have a file at pages slash sandwiches slash index.js, then that's going to map directly to the slash sandwiches page on the front end of the website after it gets built. And within that index.js file, I can use uh, I can export one of two functions, one either being get static props or get server side props. And within one of those functions, I can call the Contentful API and grab data back from Contentful. Now again, don't 
if, if this doesn't sound familiar to you, don't worry too much about the details. Just essentially know here that what I'm doing is I'm connecting to the Contentful API, and then we're displaying the transformed results back on the screen. So it looks like this. I go into Contentful, I've already got a sandwich model that supports a title, an image, and a body. And I drop all this content in there, I create a handful of sandwiches. And then locally, I run next dev to boot up my development server, and voila, I've got a front end and I've got sandwiches on screen and I am happy. Until the next project comes along. And for this next project, my editor, it's, very, it's a very similar project, but my editors are already working with sandwich data inside Trello. And so I'm convinced I don't need to move all that information over to, to Contentful. I don't want to change the, the way they're working. I want them to continue to be able to work the same way. So I want to support Trello in this way. And what does that pattern look like? Well, it looks pretty dang similar. There's a page at pages slash sandwiches slash index.js. And there are, we use either get static props again or get server side props and talk to the Trello API. So really the only difference here is we have code that's talking to the Trello API instead of the Contentful API. Now, this is what it looks like. We go add content to Trello. We move cards into one particular list and we're gonna pull all the cards from that list and that list only. And uh, so locally, I run next dev. And then once again, I've got the content on screen and everybody's happy, except me and my developers. Because what did we do? Well, we basically just duplicated a bunch of code. And sure, now we can support Trello and Contentful, but they're in two disparate repositories and it, it just feels like we redid a bunch of work. And now I was talking about one file here. It seems really silly, right? But think about building these projects at scale and how intertwined all of these content types and models and records and assets and the, the every point in the application at which you're going to have to write something that was specific to Contentful or something that was specific to Trello if you're really going to scale it out. Eventually you're gonna to get to a point where you would have to touch so many different pieces of an application just to say, well, I'm gonna use Trello instead of Contentful. At scale though, this can be a painful process, swapping out one CMS for another or one data source for another. And so that leads me to ask the second question I wanted to answer here today, which is how do I minimize rework when pivoting to a new data source? Well, I think you can do it by building an engine on which your Next.js front ends can consistently consume data. And what I, be, what I mean by that is if, this, if there's this engine and the engine provides data to your Next.js front end application, then you can have all your components, templates built out. You can have a, a base foundation on which you build new projects and you can easily swap in and out data sources because the way that you consume data is consistent from one project to another. And so the key here is how does it look different to support a Contentful from supporting a Trello or any one of the hundreds of tools that are available to you? And the way we, we accomplish that is by adding drivers to support various data sources. So these drivers will plug into the engine and then provide that same normalized data, that same experience to the front end, so your front end doesn't really have to change. It's all just about how that data is being grabbed and normalized. Now, I think there are two types of approaches we can take here. So two types of engines that we're looking at, really. One is an API-based engine, and the other is a file-based engine. Now, wait a minute. Does that sound familiar? It kind of lines up to the two types of content management systems, right? We had API-driven content management systems and Git-backed content management systems. Well, what I'm talking about here with content engines within your next project is pretty similar. An API-based engine would pull data from various sources, normalize it, transform it, and then provide uh, 
and provide it to your application through either a REST API or GraphQL API or any one of a number of different options. It's essentially a service that can provide real-time data to your Next.js front end. This tends to work a little bit better when you need real-time data or you want dynamic data, but it can certainly also work in a static sense. The file-based engine, on the other hand, pulls data from various data sources, normalizes it, and transforms it just as the API-based engine does. But the difference here is that the file-based engine will then write that data to files that can then be consumed by the front end. So that tends to work a little bit better with static builds because you're not going to write to file in dynamic situations most of the time. For an API-based engine, it looks kind of similar to our original setup. We've got our page at pages slash sandwiches slash index.js, and it has a function either get static props or get server side props that is responsible for grabbing data from the data source and rendering it on screen. However, the difference here is that we're not going directly to the data source. So we're not going directly to Contentful or directly to Trello, but rather to this engine that we've built. Maybe it's a GraphQL engine. And in doing that, we have to change a minimal amount of code in our index.js file to be able to pull data from those various sources. And so there, on the GraphQL server, there's a Contentful driver and there's a Trello driver. And that's what adds support for those services. And so the front end then is somewhat almost all the way abstracted from where that data is coming from. In other words, the difference between asking for data from Contentful and asking for data from Trello in this example might be as trivial as a single word. Take a look at these GraphQL queries. On the left, we might have a structure that looks something like this to get our content, our title, our image, our excerpt, or body, or, or whatever we're gonna call it, back from Contentful. Whereas on the right, maybe all we have to do is say Trello instead of Contentful. And all that logic is all hidden behind the scenes in our engine. And sure, we still have to do that work, but the work is away from the front end, and so the data source isn't integrated everywhere throughout our application so that if we need to change from one to the other, we can do it without touching a whole bunch of files in the process. A file-based engine looks a little bit different. It has two components, which I call the writer and the reader. Looking at the writer first, the writer is really just a command line script. I, I'm showing an example here where I've put it in the lib directory and called it writer.js. And then what we would do is we would run some import script, like npm run import Trello or npm run import Contentful. And that would tell the writer which driver to load to grab the data. And then that driver would be responsible for grabbing the data from the appropriate API, transforming it, and then giving it back to the writer, which would then write the content to markdown files. And then we could, we could import this data by running npm run import Contentful or npm run import Trello. And we would do this before we ran next dev or next build so that we would grab that content and know it existed ahead of time before we were trying to run our application. So it would physically write files into our project. The reader looks somewhat similar to this pattern that we've seen so far. We've got our index.js file. In this case, we're really only concerned with get static props because we don't need data to refresh on uh, every page load. And that get static props would make use of a shared reader, which would be responsible for reading files from the data source, uh, markdown files that would maybe have front matter at the top, and then uh, put them into structured objects and send them back to get static props, which passes them up to the index.js file and then ultimately leads to rendering them on screen. Okay, so that was a lot of information in a short period of time. So let's bring it all back together. Now, before we do, if you have any tips on upping my gift game, I will gladly recommend them. Look at this, I'm, I'm back to Schitt's Creek again. I'm, I'm clearly not as clever as I should be in my gift game. I think that's really important. So whatever advice you have for me, I will certainly take to heart. But, oh, right, back to the 
wrapping up the presentation thing and the real reason that you're actually here listening to me still. Okay, so to bring it back all together, there is no perfect data source for your project. There are tons and tons and tons of solutions out there, some that are content management systems, some that could be content management systems but are meant for other purposes first. And so look at all of those that might be relevant to you. Evaluate them based on some criteria that is important to you, to your team, to your front end projects. And find this balance between choosing the best tool for the job and working efficiently. That'll help you keep a pulse on the industry. And try a few out, see how they feel. What's, what's the actual experience like? Do you like working with those? And still, even after you've evaluated these tools, even after you've played with some of them and you might like some more than others, it still might be worthwhile to meet your content where it is, to meet your editors where they're already working and consider being a little bit flexible as a developer to be able to keep your editors comfy and working in ways that they are already used to working. And know that no matter how you go about choosing the preferred data sources for you, for your team, and for your projects, that ultimately, at some point, you're probably gonna to have to support more than just that first one. And so rather than intertwining all that logic throughout your application, go about this the smart way. Build an engine on which you can move in and out various data sources and keep your front end separate from the logic and the data that fuels your front end. Then it will be much less painful for you to swap those data sources in and out. But listen, no matter what you do, no matter how you go about this process, no matter which data sources you choose and, have, and end up working with, remember one thing. Above all else, have a little fun along the way. I'm Sean C. Davis. Thank you so much for sticking around, for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. I had a ton of fun putting this together for you. And now, if you'll excuse me, it's sandwich time.